Area Satellite Radio. Now a discussion about allowing consumers to file lawsuits or join class action suits against corporations instead of facing binding arbitration. A coalition of consumer groups talk about their new education campaign. This is 40 Minutes. Is everybody set? Okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Ed Merzwinski. I'm Consumer Program Director with the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, and it's a privilege for the public interest research groups to join some of the leading experts on a problem many of you may never have even heard about, mandatory arbitration. And we're going to talk about it, we're going to explain it, and we're going to have some victims of mandatory arbitration and talk to you today, and then we're going to announce a campaign to give us back our rights. And we have a website, stopbma.org. BMA, Binding Mandatory Arbitration. Stopbma.org is our new website. I want to first explain just briefly the order of the speakers. It's a little bit different than your list, and uh, I will just give a brief introduction then Joan Claybrook will speak, uh, then Kathy uh, ventrell Monsies will speak, and then Paul Bland. They're two attorneys who, have, who are expert in these issues. And then Fonza Luke and Tom Green, who are two victims of arbitration problems, will speak. And then Ramar Sutton will wrap it up. Uh, many of you know the sorry story of court corporate America trying to take away consumers' legal rights. Last week, the president signed the class action bill that makes it harder for class action victims to go to court by forcing them into crowded federal courts that are unfriendly to consumer interests. Around the country and in Washington, the corporations are seeking to cap the damages we receive when we are injured by medical malpractice, by doctors drug companies, or hospitals. But there's another story you may not know. One place where the corporations have yet to be able to peddle their influence is to juries. When American citizens who are harmed by corporate wrongdoing actually get to court to tell their stories, they can actually win. So the corporations came up with a new idea. What if we could create our own private legal system, stack the rules against consumers, make its proceedings secret, and, and let's make it binding on consumers, and let's impose it on them when they just do business with us. You don't even have to sign a contract. You might receive a bill stuffer changing the terms of your agreement. Binding mandatory arbitration is corporate America's dirty little secret that we're here to expose today. We're the Davids who are getting ready to fight back against the corporate Goliaths who've taken away our legal rights. Our first speaker will be Joan Claybrook. Uh, thank you, Ed, very much. Uh, my name is Joan Claybrook. I'm president of Public Citizen, and we too are pleased to be a part of this. We've been working on this issue for about five years now. Uh, uh, behind the scenes most of the time, and we're happy to make it a major public issue and a huge campaign with so many different uh, consumer organizations from across the nation. I'd like to uh, first just thank Ira Reingold of the National Association of Consumer Advocates, who has played a critical role in putting all of this information together. He is not a speaker today. He is here. He's a great expert, and if anyone needs to talk to him afterwards, please do so. Uh, uh, and um, I'd also like to mention that there's a, a great press kit that we have that has all of the material uh, that the organizations have prepared. It's also on the web page uh, at bma.org, binding mandatory arbitration.org, as well as uh, we have uh, in the press kit and on the web page uh, uh, these uh, particular posters. Most people don't realize that when they get a credit card, take out a mortgage, obtain health insurance, insurance, hire a broker or sell, to sell stocks, or even arrange for your pets to be groomed, that you're probably forfeiting the right to go to court if you're defrauded 
or you're uh, in a dispute with the company that you're working with. It happens every day through BMA, binding mandatory arbitration. Clauses, insidious paragraphs that are tucked into the fine print of an array of contracts, billions of them, almost every contract consumer signed today. When you accept a credit card, you accept an arbitration clause, almost unwittingly. And as Ed just said, sometimes when you sign that contract, you haven't accepted a BMA, a binding man mandatory arbitration clause, but later you get a bill stuffer that says now it applies if you use your credit card in the future. Most Americans are bound by many of these BMA clauses, which companies have quietly slipped into consumer contracts more and more frequently. And here's just a list of some of the firms, a partial list of some of the firms that are using these arbitration clauses in consumer contracts. And they range from lenders to consumer goods, automobiles, real estate, mobile homes, communications, tech, um, miscellaneous, which we include termites to hotels to wrestling associations, restaurants, securities investments, medical insurance, all of them. Watch out. They're on your back. This means that homeowners that are ripped off by a shady mortgage broker, patients who are denied medical coverage by an HMO, or injured in a nursing home, employees who are victimized by discrimination, and consumers caught in credit card billing scams or identity theft cannot take their case to court. The result is systematic undermining of consumer protection, civil rights, and other laws that level the playing field between big businesses and individuals. They're no longer available to you. Binding man mandatory arbitration is bad for consumers in many ways. First, it's costly. Consumers must pay high fees up front that they do not have to pay if they're filing in court, and they must pay half of the expensive arbitrator fees. Second, it stacks the deck against consumers before they even start. Only businesses are repeat users of arbitrators, and arbitrators have an incentive, therefore, to rule against the consumers to assure that they have future business from the company. Further, arbitrator awards are generally lower than those given by judges and juries, because arbitrators often try to split the difference between the two parties' positions, and they want to please the future client, the company. Unlike judges, arbitrators do not have to know or follow the law. They do not have to write an opinion. They are not legally accountable for errors. They are not required to take a legal precedent into account, and they are rarely subject to oversight by the courts. Finally, the decisions and data on which the decision are made are, are based are secret and are not recorded for others to use or to reference in the future. Arbitration was conceived as an informal, expedited process for resolving routine disputes between businesses of equal knowledge. Now, big businesses are forcing it on unknowing consumers in billions and billions of pre-printed, take-it-or-leave-it contracts as part of a larger push to erode consumer rights and cut off consumer access to the courts. We've seen it in their attempts to curb class actions, cap awards for those harmed by medical malpractice, and to close off avenues of redress for workers harmed by asbestos on the job. But all those require legislation. By contrast, BMA, binding mandatory arbitration, is imposed on consumers in everyday contracts without their knowledge. Arbitration clauses prohibit class actions, that is, people getting together who have small complaints against a company that are similar, that allows them to bring those cases because they, have, uh, they can actually hire a lawyer to represent all of them at once. Prohibit punitive damages and injunctive relief, that is, to stop a company from doing something, and often to require hearings to be held in locations inconvenient to consumers making the claims. More galling, is that many arbitration clauses allow the company to sue the consumer, but do not allow the consumer to sue the company. The consumer must go to arbitration. So we're here today to fight back. Consumers shouldn't have to give up their access to public justice just because they take out a bank loan or a credit card. 
We will fight back through every means possible. Today, we are announcing a 10-point plan of action designed to educate consumers, give them tools to fight back in the marketplace, and change the law. And this is uh, in the press kit, and it's also on the webpage, bma.org. Our education outreach includes two websites, the first of which we're announcing today, which is bma.org, and there's also a similar one that's givemebackmyrights.org, a secondary one. It explains what, what BMA clauses are, binding mandatory arbitration clauses, where they are found, and what they mean to consumers. The second is call me before you buy, buy excuse me, call before you buy, uh, dot com, which helps consumers to purchase vehicles, and Ramar Sutton will give us more details about, about that at the very end of this press conference. To help consumers help themselves, we're encouraging them to take a variety of actions, ranging from avoiding companies that use arbitration clauses to sending bill stuffers with their payments, repudiating the BMA clauses, the binding mandatory arbitration clauses. Consumers must, cl must clamor and must be heard. The, um, the bill stuffer is on the web page. It's very simple. It looks like this. It's very easy to fill out, and you just enclose it when you pay your bill. And in some cases, if you have a dispute in the end with that company, the courts have held that by inserting this clause, uh, this stuffer in your uh, bill, that you will then not be subject to arbitration. Finally, we're calling for congressional hearings and state and federal legislation to stop companies from using these arbitrary clauses that harm consumers. Now, the auto dealers uh, used to have to um, be subject to arbitration with the manufacturers. They got a piece of legislation passed by the Congress. They have lots of money, and they lobbied hard for it. And we'll hear more about that from Ramar. But if they can do it, we think the consumers should have the same protection. For without access to the courts, a major deterrent to corporate fraud, abuse, and deception in the marketplace is really lost. Arbitration might be the right remedy in some cases, but it should be voluntary, not mandatory, not binding. It should be voluntary. The choice of both parties and not mandated by corporations seeking to avoid accountability under a system of private commercial dispute resolution. We cannot allow consumers' rights to be so eroded. The use of binding mandatory arbitration, BMA clauses, must be stopped. Thank you. Good morning. I must be the short David in this battle against the Goliath. Um, my name is Kathy ventrell Monsies. I'm on the board of directors of NILA, the National Employment Lawyers Association. It's an organization of about 3,000 lawyers who represent employees in employment and discrimination lawsuits. NILA fully supports the Give Me Back Your Rights campaign to stop binding mandatory arbitration. NILA is here to emphasize that employees, like consumers, have been forced to give up their rights, particularly their civil rights, because of binding mandatory arbitration agreements, BMAs. These binding mandatory arbitration systems have set up a modern day version of separate but equal justice for employees. Companies from Circuit City to Waffle House put BMAs into employment applications, employment handbooks, your pension plans. These BMA clauses force employees to give up their federal and state employment rights if they want to get that job or keep that job. So what does this separate but equal system mean for employees? It turns out to be a very unequal system. They don't just lose their day in court. They lose the constitutional right to a trial by jury of their peers, other employees, and instead, what do they get? They get a hearing by a single arbitrator who may have ties to that very com company. They lose the protections of our civil rights laws because arbitrators don't have to follow the law. They don't even need to know the law. They lose important remedies because arbitration agreements can actually limit the damages that an employee can get. 
when she's been the victim of sexual harassment that she would otherwise get if she went to a federal or state court and had her claim heard by a jury of her peers. A BMA agreement can shorten the time to file a lawsuit and an employee can be totally unaware of that shortened time frame. A BMA agreement can eliminate the disclosure of documents by the employer which that employee would be entitled to if she could get to court. And the employer who forces the employee into this arbitration system, guess what? The employer can pick its favorite arbitrator to rule in its favor and use that arbitrator again and again when other employees sue that employer for discrimination. Now arbitration is often touted as an inexpensive and quick system of justice that's simply not true in employment discrimination cases. Employees often have to pay exorbitant fees for the arbitrator. An arbitrator can charge $250 up to $450 an hour for its fees. An arbitration hearing, the hearing itself, can drag on for weeks and the hearing itself can cost $50,000 to $100,000 just for the arbitrator's fees. An employee who has been subject to harassment or discrimination simply cannot afford to pay such a high price to have her rights heard. The simple truth is that our civil rights laws mean nothing if, if you cannot enforce them in court. NILA urges Congress and employers to put a stop to binding mandatory arbitration systems. An employee like Ms. Fonza Luke, whom you will hear from shortly, should not have to choose between her job or her civil rights. Thank you. My name is Paul Bland. I'm a staff attorney with Trial Lawyers for Public Justice. I mostly represent consumers who have been ripped off by banks or HMOs, or frequently represent people who had their civil rights violated in the employment setting. And for about eight years, literally hundreds of the people who come to us and say, the car dealer cheated me, my employer did something terrible to me, have not been able to go to court or have been afraid that they wouldn't be able to go to court because in some documents, documents squirreled away in the fine print was one of these binding mandatory arbitration clauses. We've put together for the packet a list of some examples of how these things have played out in the real world. And I urge those of you who have a chance to look through some of the examples in the packet, because some of the stories are really remarkable. What they reflect is that this system of binding mandatory arbitration frequently almost operates in a completely lawless environment. In many parts of the country, courts are unwilling to put almost any any limitations on how these things are going to operate or how they'll work. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit a couple of weeks ago said that even if an arbitrator made glaring errors of law, that that wasn't grounds to overturn an arbitration decision. Um, in a case involving baseball player Steve Garvey, Justice O'Connor of the U.S. Supreme Court said that even if the arbitrator made silly findings of fact, that that's not grounds to overturn one of these decisions. These people have almost unfettered discretion. Even going into the system, there are many parts of the country where there's almost nothing that's too unfair that you can do. So for example, there's a guy who works for an accounting firm in Connecticut. And he leaves, and then he comes back and he's going to work for them on an hourly basis. So he does a couple of hundred hours of work for him, and they decide not to pay him. And so he sues, and they say, oh no, you have to go to arbitration. And the arbitrators will be three partners of the accounting firm. Goes to the Connecticut Supreme Court. And by unanimous vote, they said, that's OK. There's nothing wrong with a partner in the firm being the judge of whether or not that same firm is going to pay out money. money. Um, there was also um, attached in um, the materials something that's printed out from the court records in a case called Warner versus von, uh, Bristow, von Butner Risto. What happened in this case is a woman accuses, a woman works for a doctor. She's, a, a, I think, a clerical employee. I'm not sure. She accuses the doctor of committing sexual harassment. She ends up being sent into arbitration in a system where virtually all of the arbitrators are, are, their principal day job is that they are lawyers for people fighting sexual harassment cases. They're defense lawyers, which is what most corporate arbitrators are in America. She goes into arbitration. If you look at the 
materials first, you'd hear so much about it's a cheaper, fairer system. The last page is the invoice from the American Arbitration Association. She was billed $18,260 to have her case heard by the defense lawyer. The next thing that this example shows is that frequently they not only send you to their own system, to their own, they have their private judge who they've picked, but frequently companies don't like the current laws in America. Maybe the Truth in Lending Act wasn't good enough for them, or maybe they thought that, that uh, the civil rights laws didn't really make them happy. So instead what they do is they write in provisions that change the laws. So for example, in court, in a civil rights case, if you um, bring a case based on your civil rights being violated by your employer, and you lose, that's the end of it. Unless you brought the case and it was frivolous. If you brought a case that had no good reason, it was frivolous, then you have to pay the other side's attorney's fees, but not otherwise. Many companies write into all their arbitration clauses what's called a loser pays rule. In fact, a guy named Ed Anderson, who's the head of the National Arbitration Forum, the most notorious of these groups, actually goes out and writes articles and gives speeches to corporate groups in which he says, you know, in our court system, it's too easy for victims to come forward. What we need is we need to have a loser pays rule so we can have, have essentially tort reform. So companies rewrite the civil rights laws. You look at this woman's form, the American Arbitration Association, so this is not even the National Arbitration Forum, it's the American Arbitration Association arbitrator enters an award against her for $207,000 for the doctor's attorney's fees. So you have a woman who brings a sexual harassment case and she's basically forced into bankruptcy by the private arbitrator picked by the doctor. Not very fair. Now, some people say, well, these are just illustrations. You know, they're, they're, they're just anecdotes. It is very hard to come up with statistics about this. It's true, because everything is secret. It's all an off-the-record private system. So, for example, the reason that we know that Bridgestone Firestone tires were blowing up and incinerating people a few years ago is it came out in litigation. But in the last couple of years, as virtually all the car dealers and most of the country have adopted binding mandatory arbitration clauses, we would never know about the Bridgestone Firestone now because it would all be decided by a secret arbitrator picked by a company. So it is hard to get good statistics, but a couple of years ago some data did leak out. In cases involving First USA Bank decided by the National Arbitration Forum, almost 20,000 cases that were decided that came out in documents that were released on the National Consumer Law Center and the Trial Lawyers for Public Justice website in a reported issued last week. In almost 20,000 cases, the consumers won 87. So for those of you who are not immediate math geniuses, you know, the rain man out there, that means that the bank won 99.6% of the time. Okay? Another interesting statistic that comes out, um, uh, the, National, uh, the, the, the Banking Association went out and paid for a report by, um, the, uh, by Ernst & Young, the accounting firm, to praise the National Arbitration Forum. And the report is, um, um, is uh, unintentionally hilarious. A rebuttal of the report is included in the press packet that sets out some of the more striking things about their, um, their methodology. Um, but one of the things you note in this is that the National Arbitration Forum conducts 50,000 arbitrations a year, nearly all of them brought by corporations against individuals where they use their clause affirmatively to collect money from people. In four years, according to the Ernst & Young report, the total number of cases that any consumer brought against a corporation in front of the National Arbitration Forum is 256 in four years. This is not a consumer system. In fact, I know a number of consumer lawyers who consider it basically legal malpractice to have your client go in front of the National Arbitration Forum when they boast about a loser pay clause. No one who comes into me and says, oh, you know, the car dealer ripped me off. I got a lousy car. It's a lemon. I spent $17,000 for this piece of junk. And you go to them and say, well, look, you know, you can go and arbitrate this. But by the way, if you lose, you're probably going to have to pay $75,000 to the car dealer's lawyers. And everyone says pass, which makes a lot of sense. 50,000 cases a year that corporations bring in this corporate friendly form, 256 in four years. And this is, in the form, this is in a report that the Bankers Association paid for to show how fair the system is. It's their own report. Probably the worst case that we have seen in our office in the eight years I've been working on this issue is Ms. Fonza Luke's case. This woman works for a hospital for 27 years. There's one year in which they had a shortage of nurses where she worked all 356 days of the year, 365 days of the year. She worked every Saturday and Sunday throughout a year. This woman who arrives at work at 5 a.m. most days. 27 years in her employment, the hospital comes to her and says, oh, 
we want you to sign this agreement that you have to give up your legal and constitutional rights if you want to keep working here. And she says, no. So the hospital gets that they didn't close the deal on this, right? Because she said, no. So they come to her a year later and they say, look, we're really, we're not kidding. We want you to sign this. And she thinks it over. It's not an easy decision for anybody to th take the risk of losing their job. But she says, no, I'm not going to sign it. Another year passes. She is terminated for reasons that they would never terminate a white male employee. She tries to bring a lawsuit. Federal district court says, well, just because you said no, you still are bound by the arbitration clause because it was, it was in the contract and you kept working there. So we get this case. We thought, how could you possibly lose this case? This is the most outrageous thing we've ever heard. U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit held, oh, yeah, well, just because she said no, I refuse to sign it, she's still bound by the corporation's arbitration clause. It's probably the single most outrageous um, illustration of what's happened in this. And her story is amazing. Because you think about the courage that this woman had to, use, had to employ to say after 27 years of this job, no, I refuse to sign it. Most people out there wouldn't do this. I mean, the problem is that most people don't even pay attention to when they're losing their rights. And here you have someone who stood up and said, no, I'm not going to give up my rights. And you have a federal court of appeals saying, well, so what? I mean, so I, th I think that this is someone you really should listen to because her story is um, it's infuriating and tragic. I just, she said she was lying. Ms. Luke. Hi, my name is Fonza Luke, and I have been with the Baptist Healthcare System for 30 years plus. I actually went to school there and started working there as an employee after school. Uh, I really, I'm, I'm still in shock, and it's been some years. Uh, when I first started working there, we didn't have arbitration. Uh, you had a problem, you talked about it, and in some cases while I was working there, there was one or two people that did, did sue and they did win. After working there for 27 plus years, we did have an employees meeting. I attended the meeting. They came up with the forms and said that everybody had to sign. Well, I read the form and I thought about it and I said, well, if I sign this, then am I signing my rights away? And they did tell me I would have to arbitrate. I said, well, that's signing my rights away, and I disagree with that. I won't sign it. They said, well, you have to sign it or you'll be terminated. I said, well, you know, I won't sign. I laid the form aside, and I left. When you attend meetings at Baptist Princeton, it's a list. As you come in, you sign the sheet. That way, when they go back and check, they know whether or not you attended the meeting. So a few Two weeks later, I guess, uh, the supervisor came back and she said, Miss Luke, you still need to sign your form. So I had discussed this with my husband and he said, well, if you do that, you're signing away your rights and you really shouldn't do that. So again, I refused. I said, well, no, you know, I'm not signing the form. So I continued to work at Baptist Medical Center. And during this time, we had a bad TB outbreak in the labs. So I would be the lucky person. Everybody had to take the medicine, but I actually got a spot on my lungs. So after going through this, I decided, well, we all got together and decided we would file a lawsuit. Well, during the course of those years, leading up until when I was finally terminated, little by little, they figured out a way to get everybody out for some reason or another. But I think I was a good employee. Like I say, I've been there for all these years. Instead of getting the work at six o'clock. I'm always work at five o'clock. I get things set up and I've always tried to attend any kind of meeting they have to have any continuous education program. I signed up for that because I feel like the more I learn, the safer my job is and the more of use I can be to the company. So I never miss any meetings or conferences, anything that they have that I can attend. So leading up to my dismissal, I attended a conference that was scheduled in Atlanta, and uh, they only gave me two days. I requested three. They denied the third one, so I did what the policy say. I called in for that third day. That's what your policy say. So when I got back, they decided they would terminate me. So I had no recourse. I went to an attorney who was Mr. Mark Elvis, the one that I went to, and uh, he took the case and decided we would file a lawsuit and of course one of the first things they did was say you can't do that because you signed the arbitration form. 
Well, when I went back to the day of the meeting, pulled the file, and looked, there was my form with no signature. So I said, well, I didn't sign, so you can't hold me to this. And they said they could, and they continued to do so, and that's how we got involved with trial lawyers, because Mr. Elvis contacted them. They stepped in, and as it is, they told me, even though I didn't sign it, I continued to work for the company. Therefore, I must have agreed. Well, I'm saying you told me you would fire me, and you didn't. So, <laughs> I mean, how can you say that you kept your word? Because, I mean, you didn't fire me. I continued to work. So that's where I am now. I'm you know, I didn't sign my rights away, and I will continue to fight and say I didn't, I didn't sign it, so why hold me to it? I just think that's unfair, and they're forcing me to accept this, and I didn't. But apparently, you know, whether you sign or not, you don't have a leg to stand on it. I'm in agreement with them. We've got to fight this. That's just not fair. Good morning, my name is Tom Green. I reside in Enterprise, Alabama with my wife, Ruth Nan. I'm retired and have a small farm out on the outskirts of Enterprise. I began production agriculture in 1990 following a military career in federal service. My wife had been employed as a poultry pro with, by a poultry processor since 1980, which made us pretty familiar with the industry. We chose to enter the business as contract poultry producers on invitation. It appeared to be a, a business that we could take into our golden years and uh, also grow our estate. We qualified for and borrowed half a million dollars to construct four 500 foot by 40 foot chicken houses on our 90 acre South Alabama farm. Our farm and the new construction served as collateral for financing the project <coughs> financing and the project began in June 1990 was completed in October of that year. It's noteworthy that uh, there were no dispute resolutions and no arbitration clauses in the initial contract that we got. The, uh, after several bumps in the road, we did okay. Over the five years that we were in business, we maintained an above average production profile. We were servicing our loan at an excellent rate. 18 months into the contract, the company required an upgrade of equipment uh, that required an additional $30,000 of capital and added to our debt, debt load. The company began modifying the contract each time that the, they required their farms to adjust equipment, adjust procedures, and adjust the pay rates. The contracts became increasingly legalistic and binding. I chose only to sign those contracts that I considered acceptable. In November 1995, the company offered a concrete uh, contract containing binding arbitration. I've got an exhibit in your packet somewhere. They stipulated that all previous contracts were rendered null and void, and the new contract must be signed in order to continue doing business with the company on a flock-to-flock -flock basis. Just briefly, flock-to-flock -flock means that when the chickens are placed, you have a contract. When the chickens exit, you have no contract. And each, each contract is an add-on from the previous. Congress certainly did not intend for arbitration uh, to be used to hold citizens. Whoops, I'm sorry I got my page out of place. I'm a page person, so uh, you'll forgive me. Um, Ruth Nan and I wrestled with this equation, with, with this change in our lives and the fact that we, we had to sign this arbitration agreement. And we bumped it against those principles which, which guided and protected our family for all these years. As a soldier, a war veteran who had drawn blood in defense of those principles, I just could not sign that contract. This decision, uh, was based on the fact that the company refused to honor my original contract. They chose not to allow 
a contract on my farm unless I sign the clause, holding them harmless. Without a contract, my investment was rendered useless. I could not sell my farm and recover financially. This decision to retain my legal rights and hold my firm with my personal liberties led to foreclosure and loss of our business and our farm. Arbitration violates the fundamental liberties our Constitution extends to us as, as free citizens in this great republic. It cannot be and it must not be looked at lightly by Americans and given a pass as an acceptable practice or else it surely will become law. And it's not. Here's why it shouldn't. Arbitration denies access to public courts. Arbitration is not a court. Arbitration is not public. Arbitration is private. Arbitration is, tra is not transparent. Arbitration does not have traditional rules of evidence. Arbitration allows hearsay. Arbitration is decided by non-legal individuals selected by, uh, primarily by the contract holder. Arbitration was reluctantly allowed in 1925 Congress to, to help industry privately resolve proprietary disputes among corporations. And I, I can see where they did that, but it, it was reluctance on the Congress to pass that law. It was not intended for the general public consumer contracts and other general contracts. Congress certainly did not intend for arbitration to be used to hold citizens hostage to unconscionable contract stipulations. Congress certainly did not intend for business to hide from accountability by granting them immunity through arbitration arrangements. With uninformed and misinformed customers. Congress certainly did not intend for our nation's farmers to be held at to subsistence level existence by unscrupulous manipulators of their 1925 American Arbitration Act. You know, we're so blessed in this country and in such a time as this, we need not allow those blessings to melt away. The erosion of fundamental freedoms being heaped upon American citizens threatens the very concept of our inalienable rights as citizens. You know, I want to humbly thank for the thank everybody, whoever brought me here. I want to thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation in such a in such a prestigious forum. You know, those those of you who truly love, and I'm talking to you journalists, those of you who truly love and value your noble prof profession, I ask that you look at the pervasions generated by the commerce at any price mindset at every level and every branch of our government. Ask yourselves if you indeed are the fourth estate. Challenge your literary skills and report as if your personal freedoms were at stake. If your institution won't allow it, consider changing your contract. <laughs> Thank you. This one. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is. This is Ramar Sutton, and I'm president of the Consumer Task Force for Automotive Issues. For 20 years, I've pretty much tracked the dark side of what's happening in the American automobile business, and frankly, I've wondered how it can get darker. But the dark side of the automobile business changed real quickly, virtually overnight. The very day, car dealerships started putting BMA clauses in their contracts. That instant, things changed. The attitude of car dealerships went very quickly into an attitude of being very lawless and very reckless in their selling attitude when it came to consumers. Not surprisingly, bad dealers got a lot worse real quickly, but unfortunately, even some good dealers, and there are many good car dealers out there, began to push and exceed the legal limits that they should be taking when it comes to sales techniques. Now it doesn't matter whether you're buying a car or you're leasing a car, whether you're buying a new or a used car, whether you're buying, worrying about a dealer or you're worrying about a manufacturer. If you are dealing with a dealer that has a BMA clause in it, you are dealing in a very risky business. 
That's why today our coalition is announcing the following things. Number one, we're launching a Call Before You Buy initiative. Call Before You Buy encourages consumers to refuse to buy vehicles from sellers who have BMA clauses. Why should any consumer in America buy a vehicle from someone with a BMA clause? Our website, Call Before You Buy, tells consumers the truth about BMA and what's happening at car dealership, and it shows them how not to be caught in these clauses. Today, our coalition is also calling upon the NADA, the National Automobile Dealers Association, to join this coalition and to join our efforts to stop the use of BMA clauses at automobile dealerships. NADA represents virtually every car dealership in this country, and though you may not know it, nearly five years ago, NADA itself issued a statement saying that it does not support BMA clauses in consumer contracts, including contracts at automobile dealerships. You have a copy of that letter in your kit. We think it's time, after five years, that the NADA should ask its members to honor their own resolution. Our campaign today also asks that consumers consider moving their loans from loan places that have BMA clauses to those that do not. Many small banks, many credit unions do not do not have BMA clauses in their contracts. Why would anybody want to frequent a loan source that is going to take away your rights, folks? Finally, we know that there are still some car dealers out there who do not require BMA clauses. Today, we are therefore asking BMA-free dealerships to contact us through our website. And if they are a BMA dealership, we will post their dealership on our website and we will encourage consumers to go to that dealership. If you're in the market for car today, stay away from car dealerships who want to take your rights, folks. Call before you buy. Thanks much. Uh, we'll take your questions now. I want to repeat, the websites are all accessible from stopbma.org. That's all you have to remember, S-T-O-P-B-M-A dot O-R-G. Uh, questions from the uh, media, please identify yourself briefly. Any questions for the panel? Yeah, hi, uh, Ed Ronco with St. Louis Post Dispatch. What do you think are, are the political chances of, of getting Congress to go along with, with stopping BMA? Um, what do you, th you mentioned David versus Goliath. What do you think the odds are here? How, how's the fight gonna go? We think we have a chance. I'll let Joan Claybrook speak to it. Well, we think that um, the Congress, which passed the uh, special deal for car dealers, that they wouldn't have to have BMA, binding mandatory arbitration clauses with manufacturers, sets a precedent and a recognition that these are bad. They also passed a bill in the Senate a couple of years ago dealing with farmers, the same thing. So we believe that we have to have a big educational effort first and to educate members of Congress as well as the public. We're trying to get a public clamor on this because I think the public realizes that these clauses are really harmful and hurtful. Not only if they challenge the company, but also it removes the deterrent for these companies to behave themselves in the marketplace. So it's an educational program first, legislation next. Other questions? Well, uh, we appreciate you coming, and again, the website, stopbma.org, should be active now. If not, it will be up in a few minutes. And uh, take a look, consumer and fight back and get back your rights. Thank you very much.